Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Hakula, a professor at the USC Price School of Public Policy at the University of Southern California. And I'm here today to talk to you about Chapter 5 from my book, China from a U.S. Policy Perspective. Chapter 5 focuses on China from a U.S. Climate Change Perspective. Now, the most fundamental thing to know about climate change from a policy perspective is that climate change is a global phenomenon that carbon emissions from anywhere in the world, whether it's the US, China, or elsewhere, all contribute equally to the phenomenon of climate change, which in turn is generating uh, weather-related uh, adverse weather-related impacts in the U.S. and anywhere else around the globe. So let's take a look at what is happening on a global scale. We look at the major contributors, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions. We can see that up until about 2005, 15 years ago, the U.S. was by far the largest contributor uh, of carbon dioxide emissions. But in the last 15 years, China has surpassed the U.S. and by far exceeded it. So by now, China's carbon dioxide emissions are roughly equivalent to that of the U.S. and Europe combined, and they're continuing to grow while carbon dioxide emissions in the US and in Europe are trending downwards as we move into more of green growth. But as noted at the outset, anywhere that these emissions occur, the impact is the same and from a U.S. perspective, of course, we're most interested, most concerned about how it's impact, impacting us here at home. And we can see that, in fact, there has been a steady uh, observable uh, global warming trend that is certainly evident in the United States. And as I'm recording this, there are wildfires raging up and down the coast, the west coast of the United States uh, un at an unprecedented scale. And many attribute this uh, to climate change. So these, it's a global phenomenon, but we're part of that globe. And so it's concern to all of us. And so what we have in effect is a collective action challenge at a global scale. And that challenge is how to share the burden of mitigation effectively. And when we talk about a burden, it's really that of a limiting of mitigation that is really limiting uh, the increase in the global warming. And finding a way to do that through mitigation efforts that we'll discuss in just a moment um, at a global scale, you can imagine there are 197 parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So you can just imagine the challenges of 100, having 197 uh, different countries uh, trying to negotiate with each other uh, in good faith on measures that each one will take to keep the global increase in carbon dioxide emissions sufficiently low that it limits the rise in temperatures to an extent that will in turn limit the weather-related, climate-related impacts um, that would otherwise adversely affect us in the United States and people everywhere else. The challenges of reaching such an agreement are formidable because of the number of, of countries involved and because the 
the plain truth is that mitigating is costly. The reason people don't want to mitigate is because it does entail sacrifices. It entails trade-offs that are difficult to make. And any country would rather not do that. Any country would rather that other countries um, do the mitigation effort and in effect be free riders on the mitigation uh, efforts of other countries. But of course, if all countries look to do that, um, we, don't, we don't get the job done. And so if we're going to get the job done, it does require each country to, to do its fair share. And in particular, for China and the US, as the two leading emitters of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, it really is incumbent upon these two countries to not only do their share, fair share, but also to uh, exert joint leadership, global leadership, and set an example for others. Because if, if China and the US as the leading emitters don't do their share and don't demonstrate commitment and don't demonstrate a willingness to be reasonable in terms of the, the kinds of trade-offs and what, what is a fair burden sharing, uh, then it's very difficult to imagine that other countries would somehow uh, be able to, to get the job done on their own. The other thing that's uh, very important about the US and China in this regard is that China uh, really is kind of representative of the global south, of developing countries, while the US is representative of the global north, countries, developed countries. And the trade-offs, the, the, the trade-offs between economic growth and carbon dioxide emissions are different in developing countries and developed countries. Developed countries have already been through the uh, economic growth that developing countries are still aspiring to. And so there are some real equity issues involved in this as well. But there are also opportunities for countries on that north-south divide to collaborate. So just to give one example, if the US is able to sell to China um, green technologies that will help China to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions, that could have the seeds of a kind of a win-win arrangement. And there may be other things that can be done. And again, it's up to the US and China to exert leadership in that regard. So are we getting there? Not yet. Uh, according to this author, it seems likely that mid and late 21st century warming will significantly exceed two degrees centigrade even if the Paris pledges are fully implemented. And of course, they are not being fully implemented. So that's double bad news. Even if we were fully implementing and committed to the Paris Accords, we're still not likely to meet the target limits. But even worse than that, we're not meeting those Paris Accords. Paris Accord Agreement. So if we look then within the US and think, well, what are the policy options that we consider? I, I point to three C's, Clean Air Act, Carbon Tax, and Cap and Trade. And I'll visit, we'll visit each of these briefly. The Clean Air Act from 1990 demonstrated quite convincingly as shown here that it is possible to intervene in a way that seeks to limit through regulation and direct uh, regulation and control to limit the emission of these kinds of noxious gases. This is carbon monoxide, not dioxide, and sulfur dioxide, uh, nitrogen oxide, et cetera, nitrous oxide, other pollutants that were targeted by the Clean Air Act that targeting did in fact lead to a steady reduction 
of those pollution emitting emissions while the economy continued to grow. This is real output. So after adjusting for inflation. So it shows that it is possible to enjoy economic growth at the same time that one is limiting these kinds of emissions, even though these emissions are a byproduct of certain modes of economic growth. So essentially, this is what green growth is about, is finding ways to continue growing while reducing noxious emissions. And so one strategy is to include carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases under the purview of something like the, of the Clean Air Act. A, another step in that is to look at cap and trade. Cap and trade has some of the same elements in that it, puts a, it does put a cap, it shares with the Clean Air Act, it kind of limits the output of this pollutant, but it adds the trade element. So the trade side is essentially recognizing that not all firms, and here I've got the production profile of a firm A and a firm B. We don't need to go into the details here. I do so in another lecture that you might look for. But the basic idea is that this limitation, this cap, may be, may be more binding on, in this case, firm B, than it is on firm A. And since the limitation is expressed in terms of entitlements, then there's an opportunity to trade these entitlements. And we can see here that firm B would value those entitlements more than firm A would. And so there's scope here for firm B to purchase those entitlements from firm A, and both firms would be better off while adhering to the uh, aggregate restriction uh, on the pollutant. So it's a, the trade, the cap and trade, the trade element of cap and trade is a nice add-on, a nice extension to the, uh, just a direct regulation cap without trade in effect. Now an alternative to cap and trade is to focus on the pollutant itself and to tax it. And this is uh, a standard approach in economics is to say, well, if the problem is one of an externality because there are negative externalities associated with these carbon dioxide emissions, if we have a reasonable uh, estimate of what the uh, extent of those costs are, the social cost is of carbon, then we can tax carbon emissions. And this is attractive in, in a kind of uh, conceptual way, because if one views the problem as being that of an externality, that there are social costs that are not reflected in market costs, then this, what's called a Pigovian tax, named after the, an economist from over 100 years ago, Alfred Pigou, this Pigovian tax, this carbon tax, uh, essentially internalizes that externality. So decision makers uh, in firm A, firm B, or elsewhere in the economy are able to make, are free to continue producing what they want and doing what they want, but with the understanding that if they're emitting carbon emissions, they're gonna have to make a payment that reflects and compensates society at large for the costs associated with those. Now this, by the way, is where the rise of China affects us here in the US. Because remember, global ch climate change is a global phenomenon. So as China is uh, letting out more carbon dioxide emissions, if essentially what's happening is the social cost of carbon is rising. And as that social cost of carbon is rising, the carbon tax that would be needed to remedy the issue here in the US, even though the problem may be arising in China or elsewhere in the world, because it's global in nature, it affects us in the US the same as if, the, as if those emissions were coming from here. But if under the Paris Accord or any other international agreement, we, the United States, as, as the second leading emitter in the world, 
have made our commitments and we expect other countries to make good on their commitments, then carbon tax is one way of getting at that. Now, normally I would be in favor of this kind of carbon tax approach because of what we've just discussed. It, it, it makes a direct link to the cost of carbon. But my preference in the context of climate change and greenhouse gas emissions is the cap and trade also on conceptual grounds. Uh, but here the concept is that when we go to uh, make international agreements such as the Paris Accord, we and other countries, we make our commitments in terms of the quantity emissions. Yes, we, the United States, we pledge to limit our emissions at a certain level and other countries are doing the same and we hope all of that adds up to an amount that is consistent with limiting the rise in global warming. And as we're looking to do our change, given that the commitment is directly in terms of those emissions, I like the idea of starting with that commitment and anchoring the cap and trade mechanism directly in that, and then letting prices um, for those entitlements to set themselves through the trading process. So we can either, as in this case, put a cap on emissions, set those directly, exogenously, and then allow prices to determine themselves, which is a contrast to the carbon tax, which is where the tax is determined exogenously, and then the emission levels are endogenously determined. But that means if we set the wrong tax, we may not get the emission levels that we're looking for. And so that's why I would favor the cap and trade uh, in this context. So again, just to summarize, what we have is that climate change is a global phenomenon linked to uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions. As China rises, its emissions also rise. And as a result of that, there's a rise in the social cost of carbon and the burden on every country in the world, including the United States and China and any other country, that burden is made heavier the more uh, carbon dioxide is already in place because then the more difficult it is for all of us to achieve sufficient level of mitigation. So because of the global nature of the problem, we need a global solution. We need global collaboration to bring about effective mitigation. And in order to implement our fair share within such an agreement, we have these different mechanisms such as the Clean Air Act, uh, carbon tax, and cap and trade as options for achieving that.